Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters, with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. And by WTIU members, thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. After months of federal negotiations, Governor Mike Pence says he has a plan to expand the state's Healthy Indiana plan instead of expanding Medicaid. In Indiana, we've learned that the way to change Medicaid is to base the program on what we know improves health, lowers costs, namely consumer-driven health care. What happens when someone doesn't identify with the body they're born into? It was very difficult trying to figure out what was going on and why I felt different from everybody else, why my physical body didn't seem to connect with my mind in, some, in this way. The threat of discrimination keeps many people from coming forward and finding resources. Ahead we profile two young adults who are transgender. Those stories and this week's headlines right now on Indiana News Desk. Hello, I'm Joe Wren and welcome to Indiana News Desk. 26 states chose not to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act. Indiana is one of those, but hundreds of thousands of Hoosiers still don't have health insurance, so Governor Mike Pence yesterday laid out details of an alternative health care expansion plan, which he says is built on healthy, cost-conscious decision-making. The plan is being called HIP 2.0. Sarah Whitmire has more on the proposal and why some say the plan is long overdue. At a press event this week, Governor Mike Pence rolled out HIP 2.0, a proposed expansion of the Healthy Indiana Plan. Well, HIP 2.0 is a better way. It's a better way for those hardworking Hoosiers. To better health, to better coverage, to a better health care system. At this stage, it's just a proposal, but Pence is hoping his plan to provide coverage to about 350,000 Hoosiers living in poverty will get support from federal officials. Pence's plan would cover people between ages 19 and 64 who make under $24,000 and can't currently get health care. These are people who live in the so-called coverage gap. As the debates in Washington, D.C. about the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid expansion continue, we're reforming Medicaid in Indiana. And hundreds of thousands of Hoosiers will have better access to quality health care as they aspire to a better life because Indiana is leading the way. Pence has refused to expand Medicaid to close the coverage gap, and he's been vocal in his opposition to the Affordable Care Act. HIP, which started as a pilot program six years ago and now covers nearly 40,000 Hoosiers, has always been the vehicle by which Pence said he would expand health coverage. His HIP 2.0 plan has three options, HIP Link, HIP Basic, and HIP Plus. HIP Link provides assistance to people who can't afford their employer insurance. HIP Basic provides a very limited amount of coverage to people at little or no cost. HIP Plus covers more, including dental and vision, but people are required to share some of the cost. Pence says the cost-sharing approach forces people to take more personal responsibility for their health care. They visit the ER less and tend to seek preventative care. The Indiana Hospital Association is praising Pence's plan, even though it's partially funded by increasing the state's hospital assessment fee. Government Relations Vice President Brian Tabor says it's still good for hospitals because they've struggled for years to provide care they're not compensated for. Just a couple of years ago, it was $3 billion in uncompensated care in one year. So what will happen is, as these individuals have coverage through uh, HIP 2.0, that uncompensated care will be reduced. So the costs for hospitals will be reduced. And so even through paying those payments, there will still be a net gain for hospitals. Indiana will submit its plan for federal approval by the end of June, following two required public comment meetings. Until the plan is fully reviewed, healthcare activist Rob Stone says he's holding off judgment. 
but he is optimistic. Boy, I love Indiana ingenuity, and and I'm a native-born Hoosier, and and all of that. But I'm not really sure we need to reinvent the wheel, and I'm not really sure um, that this plan um, is going to. Um, be cost effective because it looks to me like there's a lot of administrative cost built into this too. So I've got my concerns, but I also see that it could be a huge step in the right direction. And in a statement, House Democratic leader Scott Pilath wrote, if the Obama administration and Governor Pence can agree on a plan, everyone should applaud. He says it's long past time to stop with the political grandstanding over Obamacare and to start solving real problems for real people. Indiana University SPIA professor Kosali Simon joins us now to talk about, talk this out a little bit more. So under the original provisions of the Affordable Care Act, um, states have the opportunity to expand Medicaid and the federal government would uh, largely pay for most of that. What's Pence's strategy here with his plan? So Indiana is one of several states that have said that we would like to expand Medicaid but under our own terms which in, in the case of Pence means using the existing structure of the Healthy Indiana Plan. But Indiana still has Medicaid, right? Indiana still has Medicaid for all the populations that were eligible for Medicaid prior to the Affordable Care Act. So what's in question here is how we would move forward with the expansion of the Medicaid program as, as planned in the Affordable Care Act. So what kind of requirements then would HIP 2.0 need to uh, follow to be able to be approved by the federal government? or to so, comply to the, the Affordable right, Care Act. That, yeah. That's this, this big question we're waiting to see, whether the current waiver draft that's being circulated, that started yeah, circulating yesterday, is going to meet the requirements that the federal government is going to place on states' plans to expand the Medicaid program and still be qualified for the money that's in the Affordable Care Act. So the, the HIP 2.0 is, is different from the earlier HIP plan in, in some ways that, that, that Pence hopes will satisfy the federal requirements. For example, there is no longer a cap on the enrollment, and that's what the federal money would be used for. There are higher reimbursements to providers, and there are um, uh, there is some cost sharing involved, which is going to be this, this uh, what's predictably the, the sticking point because unlike with other expansions, individuals who qualify will have to pay very nominal amounts but towards this health savings account, the health savings account being the factor that characterizes the Indiana plan and mm -hmm. makes it different from other states. So Pence mentioned this 350,000 uninsured Hoosiers. Were they really, are they really going to be able to be covered by this or is something going to come up? When we think about the scope for how many people who currently don't have any source of insurance and don't qualify for Medicaid could be covered, what we're talking about is the, the maximum possible. So any plan that is provided will need to convince individuals to sign up, and we know that not everyone who's eligible signs up. Now, are there other states that are doing what uh, Indiana is doing, or is Indiana kind of going out on a limb here? There's no other state that is using the exact mechanism that Indiana is proposing, but many state, there are many states that are, are asking for permission to try something different. Premium support plans are being uh, asked for. There are, there are states that have received waivers. Arkansas is a, a well-known mm -hmm. example of a state that has been able to negotiate with the federal government for something slightly different. What's different about the Indiana plan is the use of this health savings account, this high deductible plan combined with a, an account through which the cost sharing will be paid. Well, thank you very much for adding to this discussion. Very thank interesting. Thank you for having me. Okay. Now for headlines, we go over to Alex Dirkman, who has an update on this week's top stories. Thank you, Joe. An Indiana resident is suing his local VA hospital, claiming he received permanent injuries from a botched procedure. United States Marine Corps veteran Tony Yuri filed the federal lawsuit this week. According to court documents, the treatment he received at the Richard Raudebusch Urology Clinic left him with such severe and permanent injuries he has been advised to undergo a procedure, placing a catheter through his abdomen to drain his bladder. Yuri is now receiving treatment from another doctor at the IU Health Department of Urology in Indianapolis. The suit comes at a time when the VA is being investigated for lapses in patient care. The head of the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs testified before Congress this week after the American Legion called for his resignation. The Veterans Administration in Indianapolis did not return calls seeking comment about Yuri's suit. 
Allowing same-sex couples to marry could provide a $39 million boost to Indiana's economy over the next three years. That's according to a recent study from the Williams Institute at the UCLA School of Law. The study indicates that if same-sex marriage was legalized, millions of dollars would be spent on wedding expenses, guests, travel and tourism, and sales taxes. A judge is expected to rule soon on the case, challenging the state's ban on same-sex marriage. In a more narrow ruling, he ordered Indiana to recognize the out-of-state marriage of one couple because one of the women is terminally ill with ovarian cancer. The UCLA study used self-reported census data from some 5,500 same-sex couples in Indiana living in a marriage-like arrangement to estimate the potential economic gains. Things at a Munster hospital appear to be back to normal after staff who came into contact with a MERS patient there have been cleared to return to work. All the hospital employees who had been sent home and put in home isolation tested negative for the virus in two separate tests and none showed signs of the infection. The patient was released last week from the hospital and removed from isolation. There's been no evidence of community level transmission of this virus, such as from casual contact. Most transmission has been linked to animals. News received last month that the state's No Child Left Behind waiver might be in jeopardy came as a surprise to many, including members of the State Board of Education. The report from federal education officials pointed out problems with Indiana's monitoring of low-performing schools, how it conducted teacher evaluations, and the decisions to withdraw from the Common Core. At a special meeting this week, board members said schools chief Glenda Ritz didn't properly inform them of the problems Indiana was having meeting the federal requirements linked to the waiver. Indiana has made a commitment through its waiver process that has to be honored and even if we choose to go in new directions such as new standards that has to be done in coordination with the U.S. Department of Ed and in a way that doesn't bring everything to an abrupt halt while we put other systems in place. The state must meet a June 30th deadline to prove they are meeting the federal requirements. Ritz says she's confident the state will have no trouble keeping its waiver. A trip the governor took this week to New York fueled further speculation that he is considering a presidential bid. Mike Pence said the trip was to recruit businesses to Indiana, but many believe he was also recruiting opinions as to whether to make a run for the presidency in 2016. Pence has said in interviews that he is listening to supporters who believe he would make for a good presidential candidate. Chrysler officials say a new plant they dedicated this week in Tipton will employ 850 people by 2015. The plan, plant will manufacture, manufacture nine speed transmissions for Jeep Cherokees. It has the capacity to produce 800,000 transmissions each year. An old facility at US 31 and State Road 28 sat idle for years. Chrysler has invested more than $1.6 billion and added 2,600 local jobs since 2009. A new health facility in Spencer aims to integrate both physical and mental health treatment under one roof. Claire McInerney reports on what officials are saying about how this new approach will improve patient outcomes. The Spencer Integrated Health Clinic will merge Spencer's Centerstone Behavioral and Mental Health Facility with the Johnson Nichols Health Clinic. Okay, big smile. At a groundbreaking ceremony Wednesday, health professionals praise the creation of the new center. They say mental and physical illness often go hand in hand, and if patients are treated for the two types of illnesses in different facilities, they sometimes don't get the care they need. We know that people with severe and persistent mental illness like schizophrenia die 25 years younger than the norm in the population. And when you can put physical health care right inside the mental health center, you get much better outcomes with these folks. Centerstone has placed physical clinics in some of its mental health centers, but officials say the facility in Spencer is the first truly integrated clinic. It's expected to cost $1 million and is scheduled to open early next year. Columbus Mayor Kristen Brown and board members of the Columbus Parks Department are at odds. The mayor did not show up for a meeting this week, leaving some parks board members and other city leaders left wondering what happened. The mayor was on the agenda and board member Mary Tucker said she was shocked that Brown didn't come. The issue comes after the mayor demoted parks director Ben Wagner last December. The mayor said Wagner misused a city credit card, among other allegations. Wagner said the claims are false and some city leaders think the mayor overstepped her authority. Indiana vineyards are losing as much as 75% of their grape yields because of this winter's deep freeze. As Gretchen Frazee reports, winemakers knew they were going to take a hit, but are only now discovering the full impact as their grapevines begin to bud. 
David Simmons is the co-owner of Simmons Winery near Columbus, but he isn't having a good year so far. Three-fourths of his grape crop has already been knocked out by the extreme cold weather. It's been a very, very difficult winter. Um, we've had a lot of bud damage on the, on the vines. The amount of crop damage depends largely on the type of grape. Certain varieties, like these Chamberson, are less hardy than others. The vine on my right is a Chamberson grapevine, and it has suffered a great deal of bud damage. You see only a very few live buds, actually, three or four on that vine, and that will obviously will be no crop there for at least two years because of that. The majority of Simmons crop was made up of these more delicate grapes, which died when the weather hit negative temperatures. Ultimately, the freeze cost him tens of thousands of dollars in damage, both in lost grapes and in the labor and time it takes to grow them back. Wineries across the state are experiencing similar losses, but many winemakers, including Simmons, say they'll supplement what they have left by importing more grapes from other states, so they'll still have enough wine to sell in the next few years. Crews will break ground in just a few weeks on a stadium in Kokomo. The $9 million ballpark near Wildcat Creek will hold 4,000 spectators. When it's complete next spring, the city will close its stadium at Houston Park, which does not comply with handicap accessibility guidelines and lacks concession stands and locker rooms. The city's mayor says the goal is to have nicer facilities for high schools and tournament and traveling teams. He's also not ruling out the addition of a minor league team, team in Kokomo. And 50 acres of land alongside the Wabash River in Terre Haute will soon be turned into a new trail. The trail will span 1.7 miles from Fairbanks Park to I-70. Construction was delayed last year after the EPA called for hazardous material cleanup in the area. That's expected to begin in a month so the city can proceed with, the bu with building the trail. But that just means there's another 50 acre property that's clean along the river and will be opening up the trail for public access. So we're really excited about that. That's our biggest uh, trail uh, component we're doing this year. And Joe, uh, after it's completed this fall, the trail will connect to the existing riverfront trail from US 40. And we're really seeing a lot more and more of these trails being built in cities across the state. Yes, we are. Thank you, Alex. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. What happens when you don't identify with the body you're born with? The journey of two young people trying to transition and the obstacles in their way. An Indiana University professor is part of a team that may have discovered Christopher Columbus's flagship Santa Maria. More on the evidence they've collected and what's next to ID the ship as the Santa Maria. Those stories right here on Indiana News Desk. Nature takes you places where you've never gone before. It's watching something that's actually happened. Nature sure draw me in the story. Just their power and their grace. You know, it was just so beautiful to watch them. The, the movement and just watching the body and watching the chase. Like this huge, lush, vibrant watercolor. Timbs. <laughs> there was such a shot of underneath watching these elephants swim in this deep water. I had no idea even they could swim like that. I saw the one monkey pulling on this one monkey's tail, and the monkey like, man, what you doing? What you doing? It's like the theater of the wild or something. Seven billion trillion animals living on one planet. It's like more colorful than life, than you think life can possibly be. Somewhere between the mystique and the beauty of it is reason enough to, to sit down and watch. That's life, and that's nature. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. We think of gender as the body we were born with, either being male or being female. But what happens when someone doesn't identify with the body they were born into? This is called transgender. Experts say approximately 1% of the population is transgender, but lack of awareness and discrimination of transgender people keep many from reporting their real identities. In the first of a two-part series, WTIU's Taylor Killo takes us on a journey with two transgender people who are in the process of transitioning. Every day, Kaylee Renner has to take a handful of medications. It's those and then a finasteride, which is uh, basically like Propecia, basically hair loss. Kaylee is male to female transgender, so she takes biotin for healthy hair and nail growth, an antiandrogen called spironolactone, and estrogen. 
It's a lot of work, but she says she would rather take all these pills than the medication she used to take to treat her depression. Before she realized she was transgender, things were so bad for Kaylee that she nearly lost everything. And it just quickly became obvious uh, life just kind of spiraling more out of control, f about to get expelled from school and losing jobs. It's just uh, this horrible depression of just, I don't want to do anything. And it's like, well, I have to because there's just nowhere else to go. A study published in January at the UCLA School of Law found the percent of transgender people who attempt suicide is 41 percent. That's nearly 10 times greater than the general population. As a social worker, Becky Bickle works with transgender people of all ages. She says suicidal ideations among transgender people can be triggered by dysphoria, the feeling of not being comfortable in your own skin. Dysphoria is the extreme discomfort or anxiety that someone gets in relation to being misgendered or called the gender that they do not feel they identify with. Very similar to anxiety or panic for some people um, in the moment and then after a long-term expression of that, some depressive symptoms often come, some um, lack of motivation, not wanting to get up, often suicidal ideations will come from just constant dysphoria. You're this entity that's kind of outside of your body and what you, that, that's not you. And so having things like uh, a picture taken or like being the center of attention or up on stage doing something and just putting yourself or your body out on display feels extremely uncomfortable and you're not quite sure why. IU freshman Drake Eilert is transitioning from female to male. It was very frustrating, very, of course, lonely as well, because I didn't really know anything about the LGBT community. Like coming from a small town, very conservative, uh, and especially I was raised in a conservative Christian church. Uh, it was very difficult trying to figure out what was going on and why I felt different from everybody else, why my physical body didn't seem to connect with my mind in some in this way. You know, I knew that something, um, something was eating at him. You know, I really felt like he was being consumed from the inside out. Um, and, you know, I just waited. I waited for him, you know, to be ready to talk with me. Sheila calls it a huge relief when Drake came out to her as transgender. To know that at least, um, you know, we knew what steps, you know, to um, give him completeness. So it was a, it was, I just, I was so thankful really for that day. So what exactly does it mean to be transgender? People who I, um, their natal sex or their biological sex do not match the sex that they identify with, and so their gender then is separate than the sex that they were or that they were given at birth. Miranda Warden works with transgender teens at the Indiana Youth Group in Indianapolis. She says more young people question their gender than many realize. Um, I think more and more youth are starting to question their gender and um, identifying outside this kind of strict binary that society has set up for us. The gender binary Warden refers to is the idea that everyone is strictly male or strictly female. The relatively new term gender queer refers to someone who doesn't identify completely with either gender, but somewhere in the middle. People ask, am I a girl or a boy? And I just say yes, or I just say no. It's like, I am both or I am neither. It's like, whatever. The process by which transgender people become physically closer to their identity is called transitioning. Transitioning takes a lot of time and money, and the path can be long and difficult, both emotionally and physically. But Drake and Kaylee say transitioning is essential to being who they are and being truly happy. I, I see what it does when I'm not transitioning and I don't have the resources. and so. Because when you're transitioning, there's always the question, is this who I am? Is this what I really want to do? There's, you never, you know what you want the end, end to be, but it's genetics play a certain role in that. And it's all kind of up in the air. Your mileage may vary. And it seems very, very difficult. But difficult is okay, because difficult isn't impossible. 
for those who identify as transgender. Coming out is just the first step in becoming who they truly are. Next week, we take a look at the psychological and biological process of transitioning, how much it costs, and the risks of transgender people take to become who they want to be. An Indiana University researcher says he's prepared to prove whether a ship discovered off the coast of Haiti is the famed Santa Maria. Charlie Beaker is part of a team investigating what he calls compelling evidence of a Santa Maria discovery. The vessel that sunk on Christmas Day in 1492 was the flagship of Christopher Columbus's fleet. As far as importance, this is going to be, you know, this is kind of the holy grail. Uh, we've been looking for Columbus shipwrecks for a long time. Beaker has already looked at the shipwreck and photographed it. The next phase, which he hopes to begin next month, is a diagnostic investigation. Crews will dive and recover artifacts to see if they are consistent with the 15th century ship. Beaker says the investigation could take a couple years. If it turns out to be the Santa Maria, he and his team will work with the Haitian government to determine the best approach to long-term protection of the site. Isn't that pretty cool? It is. I mean, they're saying it could take a couple of years, but now that they've made this announcement, they're saying that it's going to have to be a quick excavation because there could be looters on their way. Looters <laughs> in the ocean. Yes. <laughs> That's all the time that we have for this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news in southern Indiana throughout the week. It's all at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters, with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. And by WTIU members, thank you.